Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. From the end of the summer, hot, humid day here in Alexandria, Virginia. There is excitement in the air. It's Friday night. The NFL opened up last night. We've got a World Cup match that begins with France and New Zealand today. It's an exciting time. Welcome to our 54th uh, Congressional Roundtable. Uh, and if you can't see it, you can't shoot it, and the requirement for an overhead persistent sensor. I'm Ricky Ellison. I'm the president and founder of the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance. Its sole purpose, its only purpose, is to educate and advocate for the deployment of missile defense and its evolution, as we firmly believe, for the betterment of the world, for the betterment of mankind, for the betterment of our nation. Been doing it for 40 years, and MDA's been doing it for 20 years. So today, we are focused on an unfulfilled requirement that has been out there across all our COCOM for a persistent overhead sensor that's resilient, that's survivable, and most of all, that's affordable. And there is urgency with getting this into our COCOMs, especially U.S. Homeland COCOMs and Guam, which is U.S. Homeland, specifically Guam. And this is a requirement that's been out there for many years, not specific, unanswered. The 2022 Missile Defense Review from our administration today, that is a requirement. In testimony this year, the commander of NORTHCOM, General Van Hurt, where is it? You say the same with Admiral Aquilino. Where is it? And it goes across our, our COCOM force. And we tend to get focused on the, on the really cool stuff like the hypersonic glide capability where the proliferation of the threat is coming low, slow, <laughs> and down below. And that is where our competitors are massing capabilities to do that. And that threat has to be seen, has to be acquired, has to have fire control on that before it gets 25 miles out, which is 100 foot from the sea level, was what is what the terrestrial radars have today. So it is a pressing uh, issue, but. It is a joint requirement. Let's just think through this a little bit. You go back in the history of this type of surveillance, you can start it right at World War II in 1942, where we had 89,000 ships go across the Atlantic with balloons that protected them, overhead surveillance. And you go to the 40s and 50s when we had to take on the Russians, and we had balloons for surveillance. And you can go all the way to the 2000s when our U.S. Army used it for Afghanistan. And today, our the probably the second country in the world is getting hit. Israel has got a a uh, a dirigible up called the Dew that's working that. And in our country, we've got our our border patrol has has balloons up. But our country doesn't. And our COVID. So this has got to come to a, a movement to get this thing done. And this is where we're trying to educate and advocate for this, this concept. It's not a specific system. It is a concept that has been asked across the board on it. I've had some opportunity by, way back in the 2000s to be at the, the Douglas Proving Ground in Utah to see some of those way back when, when this was still a requirement unfulfilled. And we've had our SHIELD program uh, come up and study this problem. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, 
a challenge. So today, I think we've, we've got a great group here. And certainly, um, we want to expose that and explain the best we can on this requirement. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, and uh, he's a great one. Um, he's without doubt on this specific subject, by the best in the world. The best in the world, Dan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw that at you. You are the commander of the Army Space and Missile Defense Command for a couple of years. But before that, you were the chief of staff at STRATCOM. And before that, you were the commander of the Army Test and Evaluation Command, ATAC, which tested this stuff. And then before that, you were the commander of the biggest missile defense uh, group we have in the Army, the 32nd WMDC. So you have all those qualifications to bring forward that. And Dan's a, Dan's a great one. He's, he's a West Point grad and a Green Bay Packer. So I, I want to introduce Dan. It's all yours, sir. Hey, hey thanks very much, Ricky. And, and I slightly correct the record because I don't want uh, General Jim Dickinson to uh, think I'm taking credit for commanding the 32nd WMDC when he, in fact, commanded it while I was out in Indo-Pacon, man of the 94th. So uh, I, I just want to make sure that, you know, he had the 32nd, I had the 94th, which, you know, as we know, Indo-Pacon is responsible for 52% of the globe. So we had the majority, we were the majority stakeholder in global uh, missile defense. Hey, thanks thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to, to talk uh, talk on this uh, particular subject. And there's, uh, there, it's, there's just a, a ton of information to sh that I'd like to share here and I'll, I'll do my best to, to sort through it, and uh, and I look forward to comments and questions uh, that that will come up. So let me just rewind the tape back to 1995, if you will, 1996. I had just I was a captain. I just wrapped up a, a job as the aide de camp to General Costello, Major General Costello, who was a Fort Bliss commander, and he sent me down to the director of combat developments to do requirements work. And in 1996, we wrote what was called the Aero Staff Joint. Board, operational requirements document. And the Aerostat, uh, the Aerostat Joint Award, the JORD as we called it, became the genesis for then JLENS, Joint Land Attack Cruise Missile Elevated Netted Sensor. And, and the JLENS, as, as, we're, as we're familiar with, is what was, um, we tested it extensively at Dugway. Uh, we tested it extensively uh, up over the National Capital Region there uh, in proximity to Avenue Proving Grounds. And as we know, the tether broke and we shut that program down. Before all of that happened, though, after the Aerostat joint or and then which became the, the JLENS uh, operational requirements document, that weapons, that platform was approved. It was JROC approved. It went through rigorous analysis of alternatives. We worked with the Navy, we worked with the Air Force to find out, hey, what is the best capability to give us an elevated sensor that gets us fire control quality data, gets us surveillance capability. As you said earlier, Ricky, it is persistent. It is able to detect nap of the earth flying objects that, are, that have a very small radar cross section, able to integrate and meet requirements for things like integrated fire control, engage on remote, and contribute to a single integrated air picture. And we went through the analysis of alternatives in the run-up before we deployed the JLENS. And we looked at JSTARS, we looked at AWACS, we looked at Hawkeye, we looked at tower-based platforms, we looked at the whole host of capabilities that would provide us an elevated sensing capability. And without a doubt, the JLENS platform was the one that one that came to the forefront. And so we tested it. And out at Dugway Proving Ground, it, it showed phenomenal capability, phenomenal promise, both from the surveillance side and the fire control side. And so to, to help explain that too, so there was actually, there was two aerostats one had a surveillance radar on there, which allowed us to look, you know, as that, as that J-Lens was up at 10 to 15,000 feet, it was able to overcome things like curvature of the earth, terrain masking, 
and it, it was able to look out pretty far, and I won't talk the ranges here, but look out significantly farther than any ground-based radar could. It was able to look out persistently better than AWACS could or uh, Hawkeye could because it was persistent. You know, AWACS, you know, AWACS has got to be on orbit, Hawkeye has got to be on orbit, plus they have other missions that, that they needed to be able to do. And that was the surveillance platform. And then we had a second radar, which was the fire control radar, which was on the second balloon. And that was able to provide fire control quality data, meaning it was able to provide exact enough measurement data on a track that was flying that we could guide a missile launched from any launcher, whether it be Patriot or, or Aegis BMD, we could launch any missile or off of, a, off of um, a fighter, and we could launch a missile off, and then that fire control quality radar, after taking a, a long-range surveillance cue, the fire control quality uh, radar was able to then provide that data to the interceptor and, and affect inter, uh, engagements. So in tandem, those, those two aerostats, surveillance and fire control, provided an incredible elevated sensing capability at high altitudes to be able to look long range, survey fire control, enable us to take advantage of the max kinematic range of our interceptors then too, because again, we weren't beholden to the Earth's curvature or any kind of terrain masking limitations that we might have and able to uh, affect those engagements farther out. From an air defense perspective, kind of my mission command is I want max attrition as far forward as possible. When the threats are coming in, whether they're multiple cruise missiles, UAVs, you name it, I want to be able to max attrition as far forward as possible. I don't even want them getting close to my defended area or my defended asset. And again, an, an elevated sensor allowing me to look out over that battle space farther away, allowing me to help enable long-range engagements, uh, that, that was, the JLENS was a good solution for that. It allowed us, uh, also the JLENS allowed us to contribute to what we call engage on remote. So traditionally you'll have a launcher and an interceptor and it is it is beholden to its organic radar. So and I'll use Patriot as an example. So we have, we have Patriot launchers, you have a Patriot radar, the ra Patriot radar sees a target coming in, it tracks it, it provides fire control quality data and then we shoot the Patriot missile out at the target. And, and then it's able to affect the engagement. What the JLENS allows us to do is an engage on remote. So the JLENS now is, like I said, at 15, 10 to 15,000 feet, it's looking out a long, long ways. It is able to provide a fire control quality um, track to the Patriot interceptor and the Patriot interceptor can go out no longer is it going to be limited to this terrestrial based Patriot radar, but instead this elevated sensor, which is seen much farther away. And again, being able to then take advantage of the max kinematic range of the Patriot interceptors. And then in the case of like PAC-3 or MSE, we know that, that those missiles have got, got pretty good range. Um, it is, uh, I would say we are trying to, you had, Ricky, you had mentioned it's an unfulfilled requirement. I would say it's a gap in a recognized requirement right now that we have. We are trying to fulfill requirements for our ability to sense. And, uh, and so let me, and let me start kind of at the, at the high level. Um, when we look at the work that MDA is doing with the HBTSS, for example, you know, the intent there is to be able to develop a constellation that will give us fire control quality capabilities so that we can, we can, we can see, cap we can see, um, enemy threats, birth to death, and then be able to provide fire control quality information down to the effectors or the interceptors uh, ac across the different services to be able to get at, uh, in the case of the HBTSS uh, hypersonics. But there's no reason why, I don't see any reason why that air picture that the HBTSS uh, satellite constellation is providing would not be provided and federated out to, to all air missile defense users to take advantage of the air picture, take advantage of the fire control quality information that's being provided uh, to develop a, a single integrated air picture, then that shooters uh, would be able to, to take advantage of. Uh, we have, you know, we, we have things like uh, ALPS and, and, and spy ones and THAAD radars and Patriot radars and tp 2s et cetera, and HBTSS at that level, that constellation is just gonna help, uh, help um, improve our situational awareness. 
And then if I took it one, one level up too, we also have uh, OPIR, overhead persistent infrared radars, which do help us in terms of uh, early warning. As soon as we get uh, adversary missile launch, those OPIRs are also being able to detect uh, those launches and be able to provide and contribute to the overall uh, situational awareness and, and air pictures to our different operations centers. Um, I want to talk a little bit then uh, as we uh, as we move into, I want to talk a little bit about defensive lawmen too and the, and the architecture that, that we are working through right now with the Missile Defense Agency and the services out there. Uh, we're working through that architecture. I'm a believer that we should have, we should provide an elevated sensing capability to the defense of Guam. We need to be able to provide something that, that isn't uh, limited, that isn't going to allow curvature of the earth or train masking um, to impede our ability to look farther out, sense farther out, provide fire control quality information out. Because having an elevated sensor in the defense of Guam, again, allows that surveillance to go out, allows fire control quality data to go out, which then will enable longer range integrated fire control. So imagine, if you will, a, an elevated sensor that's at 10 to 15,000 feet providing surveillance and fire control quality data. And I have an Aegis BMD or an F-35. That's an F-35 could be out in CAF, the Aegis BMD could be out doing its mission. But now, because we've got a long range surveillance, long range fire control quality radar picture that we're providing, maybe that F-35 takes shots at cruise missiles a long way away. Maybe the Aegis B and D is able to take shots farther away. All in part of all part of providing a layered air missile defense uh, in the defense of Guam. We don't want to necessarily have to wait until the terrestrial base launchers, whether those are uh, Patriot launchers or SM3, SM6 that are back on the island. We want to again. We want max attrition as far forward as possible. And again, an elevated sensor uh, capability will allow us to do that. And this is an elevated sensor that is that is higher than what we could do on a tower-mounted sensor. You know, tower-mounted sensors, and, we're, and we, we have those, we, uh, we test with those, we're, we have operations with elevated uh, elevated sensors that are, that are on a tower, but that's just not high. To me, that, why would we limit ourselves to, you know, a 200-foot tower, 300-foot tower? We, we know, and we have, um, we have the requirement for an elevated sensor at 10 to 15,000 feet, and we've, and we've demonstrated that capability. Um, and the last thing that I'll leave you with too, because we're talking a lot about sensing, which is super important, is uh, I'll give you a ring doorbell analogy that I like to use. Now, if you have a ring doorbell and you put that on your front door, it's great because you can watch everything that happens on your front porch and you can watch the UPS person drop off a package. And then ring doorbells, then a lot of times we see it on YouTube or whatever, we'll see some thief come and pick up that box off your front porch. But you know what? Without an interceptor there, without something there to apprehend the suspect, all you did was survey it. So we have to make sure that when we talk about sensing capabilities, it has got to be tied to some sort of shooter. And kind of my follow on to the analogy is what I would like is a ring doorbell and if it sees somebody picking up a package off my front porch to steal it, uh, we have a device that would spray gravy on the dude. And then uh, we open up a door and a German shepherd goes out there and goes ahead and attacks the person on the front porch and then it saves your package from being, uh, being stolen. So um, a little bit of a little bit of a humorous uh, an, uh, analogy there. But anyways, just uh, again, that's what I want to share with you a little bit. There is a JROC requirement. When I was on the joint staff in 2000, working at then called JTAMDO, I briefed the requirement for the theater, air, and missile defense operational architecture to the JROC. And a major piece of that JROC briefing was an elevated sensor because it contributed to the four cornerstones of theater, air, and missile defense, which are engaged on remote, integrated fire control, Single integrated, single integrated air picture and automated battle management aids. 23 years later, those core tenets of the theater, air, missile defense operational architecture are still there. And it's my belief that we gotta, we gotta get after providing the elevated sensor capability already approved by the JROC and maybe the first place to take a look at 
uh, putting that would be the defense of Guam. So thanks, Ricky, for the opportunity to talk. Thanks, Dan. I look forward to the questions. Yeah. Dan, I just want to follow up with you. From your perspective, why haven't we got this thing in place? We're spending six billion plus to create an architecture. We've had years to study this. What's holding this thing up to go to those next steps to get this thing moving? And then just on a follow-on to your doorbell deal, is it viable to have a, a DE weapon on, on, on one of those? On, on one of those airships, if you're talking about one one shop, one deal in the future. But I'm, I, I just want to understand that first problem probably the most for us to understand if it's you've done all this work, you've got the chance, why are we still not even close to getting this thing in place? Yeah, so a complicated answer to that. Um, when the Jalen's tether broke and it floated out over Pennsylvania, um, that that caused, frankly, just embarrassment within the Department of Defense and uh, and some consternation. Um, and, and unfortunately, we we really didn't want to overcome that. We and so um, and so we mothballed the program and then we shut it down. And I think that's unfortunate. Um, you know, we often talk about when we're testing. You know, we 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 expect people to fail. We expect things to you know you fail and then you get better. In the instance of the Jalen's, it the tether failed under extraordinary circumstances that you know a bunch of different things aligned that re, that result in this tether failing. Um, but nonetheless, the requirement was still there. But um, we just um, we we just we were embarrassed about it happening, and, and so we shut it down. And you know, if you remember back in those days, there was no shortage of commentary. There was no shortage of uh, people with extra time in their hands to uh, make jokes about it. And uh, you know, the American public still maintained a sense of humor. But but really, um, it, it was a good capability. And, and I will defer to Corky and Ty a little bit. But you know, we test we test airplanes and jets all the time, and tragically, we we even lose lives. When we test these platforms, but we continue on with it, and we continue to test and then and then field. And for some reason, the J lens, when when it when its test didn't go very well, we shut it down. The defense of Guam gives us an opportunity to revisit uh, the decision there, and include it in the architecture. Uh, the second piece is the cost, right? So so the the cost of the J lens um, uh, was was pretty high, but. You know, it was something that was accepted. And again, when we went through the analysis of alternatives, cost is also factored in there. And once you looked at how long it took to keep an AWACS on station or a Hawkeye on station and the crews, et cetera, et cetera, again, the JLEN's cost uh, per hour was significantly lower than, than any of the manned uh, airframes. Now, your second part of your question, can we put a DE weapon on that? So uh, one of the things that we learned as we uh, were going through the requirements process and some of the testing of the Jalen's was, you know, everybody loves to secure the high ground, to, to use the SNDC motto. Everybody loves key terrain. And there was no more key terrain than 10 to 15,000 feet above. But as soon as you start trying to put other things on that platform, you're going to take away from uh, the capability of the radar because, you know, it can only be really so big to hold different components on that uh, on that platform. And so as soon as you start and want to add a DE weapon on there or a comms, an additional comms package or a chem bio uh, detection equipment, I mean, there was a whole bunch of a uh, whole bunch of different you know, modules that folks want to try to plug in there. But as soon as you put it on that platform, you wait, more, more and more weight comes on there. So now either the, the um, aerostat envelope has to get bigger or you're going to do a bunch of trades. And instead, what we did was we really looked at making this, you know, sole purposing. Now, that doesn't say, though, that the air picture provided by the J-Lens or by an elevated sensor couldn't be part of integrated fire control. So if I have autonomous drones that have a DE system on there that are flying around, there's no reason why that air picture couldn't be provided then into that autonomous drone that's maybe got DE capability to let those drones then uh, use a DE effector on the target. So hopefully that uh, answers your two questions. Yeah, that's great. Just one little more question, just for the public to understand Mio, Leo, and resiliency of Leo, why those don't work for low and slow down in the lower atmosphere 
and how you have to have, you know, a layered thing all the way down. And I guess SDA is doing that or space. So just, just to educate a little bit. Yeah, sure. So um, that's why it's proliferated, right? So you want to have proliferation because, you know, we never know exactly where an adversary is going to launch a hypersonic from. It could be from terrain. It could be launched off of a, you know, from a pylon uh, underneath the wing of an aircraft. It could be launched out of a submarine, you know. So that's why having proliferated LEO of HBTS is important. And NDA, you know, that, that's what they're working towards yeah. with the Space Development Agency. You know, they've got the first uh, first test articles up there that that we're uh, doing right now. But again, it's got to be a it's got to be a layered approach. You know, oftentimes we you know we'll talk about uh, the silver bullet. You know, we want the silver bullet to take care of everything. Well, also there's no such thing as a silver sensor. You know, sensors have got different capabilities based on power and energy outputs. And so if we try to, you know, kind of going back to my earlier uh, elevated, or my Jalen's discussion, if you try to put everything into a sensor, pretty soon it's just not going to be able to do everything. So that's why we've got to have proliferated LEO, HPTSS, and we've got to have other sensors in the architecture all contributing. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. That was great. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our, our next uh, speaker, um, we're, we're going to shift over to the operations of the Air Force. He was the deputy commander of, uh, of staff for the operations for the U.S. Air Force. He also commanded uh, the Warfare Center at Nellis Air Base. But I, I, you know, I'm biased, but I think he's the best F-22 pilot in the world. And we are fortunate to have him, uh, Charles Cochran, give us a a thought through the Air Force operations and how this fits into that and the, the requirements going forward. Thanks for the kind of intro, Ricky. Thanks uh, to the other panelists. I'm going to pick up uh, right where General Carver left off. Those were fantastic comments. And, and that I want to hit on specifically the max attrition you know, as far forward as possible. I love that. And if I could add more to that, I would say preserve commander's decision space. So if you want to talk about this from the operational perspective, Ricky, you mentioned requirements earlier, and this goes back 20, 30 years. If you want to really elevate that discussion, you say, well, requirements for commanders to have SA goes back to the documented history of the military, right? Every every, uh, every military uh, is looking for that recon, looking for that SA, what's out there, what's beyond the horizon, right? And so that has not changed. Uh, and and once balloons came along and then powered flight, you know, and then spacecraft, that allowed commanders to see further out. And that gave them the ability to have attrition further forward, to make, you know, to, to preserve decision space, know what's going on. Void articulated in the Resort Orient Decide Act. Today we're talking about Joint All Dominion Command and Control, and we're saying sense make sense act. It all starts there. And you can't do that if you don't know what the heck's going on. So that's what the operational commanders are, are, are screaming for. And so if you look at the COCOMs around the world and how they're dealing with this right now, let's start with the homeland. And I'm going to use the word criminal. It's criminal that we don't have the capability to surveil what's coming at the homeland, to identify it, and to track it, and, and if necessary, engage it as far away as possible. We saw this with the Chinese balloon. The kind of, how could we not know? How could we not know? Uh, General Van Herc is, is held responsible, held accountable for uh, defending uh, North Coms AOR, and he does not have the ability to sense, make sense, and then act because we have to deal with something as simple as this. As a celebrated sensor. Uh, Admiral Aquilino wants to say, is it? General uh, Kabul, he said, go around all the COCOMs. So, what do the operational commanders have to do? Since we haven't put in, this, in place this persistent, affordable capability, they have to burn our high end expeditionary assets. So, there's a fight. We have 31 AWACS in the United States Air Force. At any given time, only about 40% are flyable. Everybody wants every COCOM. Why? Because we haven't put in place the, the more affordable capability we're talking about. So General Van Herc eats up those sorties here with the homeland when uh, when the Russia flies to U 95s near the coast, or or when the when the president's traveling somewhere and he is responsible for surveilling that area. Instead of having in place in our homeland, where we control the the, the territory, uh, having in place these sensors, we're having to use the expeditionary sensors that Aquilino, Kabuli, and others need. Right. Meanwhile. Uh, you go over to General Kabul's AOR. He's got to deal with a potential ru a Russian cruise missile threat to NATO. What are we doing there? We've sent AWACS over there. The, some of the few AWACS we have. We got F-22s over there, F-35s. We're burning those airplanes up. Uh, we're flying them left and right. We're taking E-2s out of the carrier air wings, and so stripping that that uh, 
important uh, uh, air wing from its, its capability and, and Vernon Sorry's there. All this could be done much, in a much more affordable fashion, a much more persistent fashion, if we simply leverage the capabilities that General Carver was talking about and what him and his teams worked so hard to develop over, over the last several years. If we do that, then we preserve the readiness of the systems and the readiness of the individuals who operate the systems for a potential high-end flight. All right? And I'll add on, because I, I, I don't want to keep rambling because we're, we're running short on time. There's also a deterrent effect here. If, if the bad guys know that you can see what, what they're doing, what you're sending their way, uh, that they're going to be held accountable, then, uh, then I think that makes them think twice before they actually uh, launch something. I'll take this even to the narcotics. There was a, a counter-narcotics fight. There was an article that came out this morning. The U.S. Marines are taking a page out of uh, a narcotic, narcotic traffickers, traffickers playbook and building uh, low-profile, unmanned resupply vessels, right? How do you track those? Elevated sensors, right? And so we have got to get after this. We've got to get after it now. There's no excuse for not doing it in our home, on our home turf here. Yeah. There's no excuse for not, and Guam is our home turf, like you said. There's also no excuse for not uh, helping our allies do it. Because again, if our allies have these capabilities, then again, we preserve a high-end manned aircraft for expeditionary operations should a fight occur. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Kirby. Can you talk to, because this, this somewhat seems like the E7's the be all end all answer to that. Can you talk to that? Can you talk to the overhead horizon radar that we're putting six of those things in? Can you talk to the terrestrial answers possibly to this balloon? And from your perspective, why haven't we, I mean, this is a solid argument. Why yeah. hasn't this little thing been made in place? Is, is it, it, it so, okay, that's that's well, first off, their approach, like John Harper said. So, there's no one single answer. We need to get after all the things you're talking about. E7, if, we, if we're all thinking alike, we're not thinking. If we're just thinking E7 is going to replace the E3 and that'll make everybody happy, again, we're going to be burning an expensive manned asset that doesn't have uh, the persistence yeah. of something like the, like the J Wings or, or a light capability. So, the E7 should be preserved, should be preserved for expeditionary operations. No. We we shouldn't have to use an E7. I mean, you, could, you could use it on a case-by-case -case basis here and there, but you should be able to know what's going on in your own neighborhood mm -hmm. without having to get manned assets uh, airborne. Over-the-horizon radars are great. We're investing in those, but that's a surveillance capability, mm -hmm. right? That helps with the decision space, right? I know something's coming at me, but it's not a uh, fire control quality track so that I can then uh, squirt the gravy on that guy and send the German Shepherd after him, as General Carver said. Why haven't we done this? I can't answer that. I just retired from that uh, five-sided building, and I, if I if I knew how to solve that problem, I'd be a rich. Would, would you think it's it's an Air Force mission? It's, this is in that domain, or is it an Army mission? Just throwing that, or is it truly joint? And if it's truly joint, are we going to be able to fund? It? Maybe that's well. The, the, end use, joint. the end user's joint, right? Our combatant commander's yeah. joint. I I really I really have no. Uh, I, I I don't care which service takes us on, but we should be able to surveil our own territory Absolutely. persistently in an affordable fashion. As a taxpayer, we should, as taxpayers, we should be demanding it. Congress should be demanding it, uh, and we, we should get after this yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have our next uh, presenter, uh, Ty Thomas, who is the former deputy uh, commander for Pacific uh, Air Forces. He's been a brilliant mind, uh, and he's in the right place to give us a strategic thought on the program and where we're going. And we'd love to hear your opinion. Thanks, Tom. Okay, thanks. Uh, good morning, Ricky and uh, General Carbler and Corky. Great to join you on the panel here. And uh, this is an awesome topic, topic to go over. And I'll start with, you know, pivoting off what, what you guys mentioned. We may have a listener out there that's saying, well, it's just not that simple. This is really complex technology and there's a huge architecture that's got to fit in and all that. And, you know, I'll concede that some of the technology may be complicated, but the principle, we all got to understand, this is very simple. This is a layer in our sensing that's then going to enable the rest of our integrated air missile defenses to be so much more effective. And in the absence of it, we absolutely have a hole in our swing. And we know that this can work because General Carbon worked on the very program. It did work. Yeah, okay, so there was a tether that failed, but the technology itself worked then, 
and it's even better now. Are our sensors better now, 15 years later? Yeah, I think so. And uh, so this can be done, and the requirement for it is incredibly simple. Just to, to maybe add a little bit to, to what was said and introduce a few additional thoughts before we go to questions, Ricky. Um, the you know, what I heard and, and uh, fully agree with is there's there's really about five requirements that go into this. We we talk quite a bit about the first three. Um, so you need you need an element of persistence. Okay, you have to be there. You have to see there. You have to to consistently be able to do that. Second, you got to be able to do both surveillance and, and then also pass fire and quality tracks and the sensor, um, you know, maybe a different sensor on the same platform to do the same thing. The third is the ability to communicate, as Dan mentioned, you know, if you want to be able to do um, uh, launch on remote, you got to be able to pass a good track and you have a comp system to do it. But two that we haven't really talked about, and this gets to Corky, your comments also about the, the almost abominable state of the fact that General Van Herc as the NORTHCOM commander can't see the approaches to the continental United States um, is relocatable. And my point there is, is that um, even if we want to economize some in the acquisition or procurement of this capability, we might be able to do that. And it's by the virtue of the fact that we select a system that can be rel relocatable. So let's say that we don't have um, a reason to be concerned in Europe um, and we need to concentrate some more assets from the homeland or for the second island chain in the Indo-Pacific. So whatever system we choose that can be relocatable gives us that opportunity. We may or may not want to be able to use it, but I believe that the system needs to have some relocatability. That may suggest that airships may be a better opportunity than um, a tethered system, but it certainly is something that we should look at. Even within the NORTHCOM AO, maybe this is a Russian threat and we need to be more focused on the East Coast. It doesn't mean that Russia isn't a Pacific power as well, but if you get the point that, that relocatability gives commanders options to see over the horizon, as, as Corky pointed out, that they need for that decision space with more mass and more capability than if they were fixed systems. And the last one we didn't talk about, but survivability is really important. And some might go, what, a, a tethered system? How could that possibly be survivable? Or how could an airship be survivable? Survivable in the environment in which it needs to operate. Okay, so the second island chain is not the first island chain. There are plenty of air to surface and surface to surface threats to the second island chain. There aren't that many air to air threats to the second island chain. So an airship or a tethered uh, system probably is survivable in the second island chain. Far enough back, it's probably survivable in Europe as well. And certainly those things are gonna be survivable over the continental United States and, and Alaska. So um, <clears throat> it's an important factor but it's not a limiting factor as long as we understand the environment in which they're to be used. So I think those five qualities are particularly important. Corky kind of ran through the alternatives, but I'm sure some of the audience are thinking through the alternatives. What I'll add to that is that we need systems like the E7, the E2, or the E3 to be able to be forward. Particularly, I'll just use the Pacific fight as the example. Our best cruise missile defense of the second island chain is stopping the H-6 bomber from ever getting into a launch basket for the CJ-20 missile. Okay, we stop that, we just cut the threat to the second island chain by more than half. Guess who's going to identify those targets for our fighters that are forward in defensive counter air caps, the E-7, the E-3, or the E-2 in conjunction with the carrier strike group? That is where we need them. Those are limited assets. They are highly relocatable because they're moving at jet speeds, and that's exactly what we need them to be able to do. So that's where those systems belong. They have exquisite capabilities, especially the E-7, that that's what we need in that environment, too, because there's going to be massive electronic warfare going on, and that's not going to be happening near as much far back where we need this overhead persistent sensor associated with uh, defense, uh, integrated air missile defense of the second island chain. So that's also an important distinction about why you need those those high-end sensors out forward. Um, space, uh, General Carbo brought up, Dan brought up about space, really, really important that anything we put up there that's got the ability to feed in surveillance and even uh, track quality uh, data contributes. However, as we talked about, it's got to be layered because persistence from the space domain is going to require large constellations. Large constellations equate to cost. We may still pay that bill because that may be the only way to get after some of the targets that we're talking about, hypersonics in particular. However, there's still vulnerability in the low Earth orbit, right? 
I mean, it, it will only take a few firecrackers that go off in low Earth orbit, and all of a sudden, everything that we have in low Earth orbit is at risk. So we've got to be able to back up that capability with something that's in the air domain and is looking out at the ranges that we're talking about. So uh, we, we, we need to, you know, to the silver bullet, there isn't one, and we've got to have the layers, and the air provides a huge portion of it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll close with, um, you know, Ricky, a, a bit of an answer to, to your question also that you posed earlier to Dan, which is, um, why, why haven't we fielded it? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll challenge our own, you know, defense community. We have about a, a 15 second attention span on the discussion about JLIDs. Oh, it broke its tether, it flew off into Pennsylvania. Why would we ever want to do that again? That was silly. Next topic. We have to actually be a little bit more uh, willing to examine the, the discussion and go, uh, there was a lot that was gained out of that, and it is now 20, 15 years later, and we really need to be able to have a deep conversation about it. I know that the CRT is an attempt to do that. Um, and on the idea of putting hanging additional stuff on there, Ricky, uh, let's try to keep it as simple as it possible. Simple. The technology is somewhat somewhat complicated as it is. The principle is not complicated at all. Um, but I think the first thing we should do is get up there, prove it, show that we can do all of the things associated with launch on remote, passing along, extending the capability systems that we got. Everybody's going to go, oh my gosh, look what we just did. Look what capability we just added to our system. And then we'll, they'll be asking, why didn't we get 20 of them last year? Good place to be in, a little bit ridiculous of a discussion, but that's where, you know, I hope we're at in, in a few years from now. So hope that helps. This is a great conversation yeah. and uh, looking forward to questions. Over. Thank, thanks, Todd. Hey, hey Ricky. Yeah, if I could, uh, I just want to um, answer one of Ty. So one of the requirements, Ty, too, was uh, with the Jalen's was a mobile mooring station, recognizing that it needed to be relocatable. Now, it's not a you know, move on, shoot on the move kind of capability, but it was the mobile mooring station designed specifically to make sure that this was relocatable. And then another piece too that I failed to mention as part of the requirements was the robust combat ID that that elevated sensor is able to provide to get, be able to give the JFAC and the Area Air Defense Commander confidence as we talk about, you know, um, max attrition as far forward as possible and joint engagement zones, uh, weapons-free zones, whatever um, measures that we put in place, the robust combat ID that the elevated sensor was able to provide. And, uh, and then maybe the last thing before we go to Q&A too, um, you know, given how far we've come with uh, sensor technology and the improvements there, you know, given where we're at with balloon station keeping, for example, and the ability to keep a a constellation of balloons in an area, given AI, given what the commercial industry has done, um, you know, it, this solution doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, the the son of JLens either. There are, I think, there are opportunities out there to explore other capabilities uh, to get that uh, elevated sensor uh, to meet that elevated sensor requirement again to for improved uh, surveillance and fire control range. Thanks. Dan, I, I want to just follow up with you. What was it when you were doing the JLens? Did you have an exercise or you for the East Coast or for the United States or for Guam? Did you position that and has it been tested for those regions to do that? Or can you go into that if that did happen? And what perhaps is the architecture if you were going to go JLens for the homeland of the US? Yeah, so we did extensive testing at White Sands, uh, Dugway, and then it was on station for quite a bit uh, out in the Aberdeen area. And um, yeah, multiple different types of scenarios were run, um, both with the uh, with the live uh, J lens, with the live aerostat, but also uh, as part of the Nimble Fire series that we did at JTAMDO and JAMDO on the Virtual Warfare Center, uh, just so we'd explore different concepts in different scenarios with the capability. So yeah, so. Uh, again, a robust amount of data went into this as part of the AOA and then as part of the overall, uh, getting the overall approval from the JROC. Thanks, Dan. Okay, now, I just want to, one more question before we go in. Ty, the same thing with MEO, right? If, if, if that LEO layer is susceptible 
for um, resilience and survivability, we also need to go to that next level, which I don't think we're at yet with the NEO level to be able to look down as well and integrate into that layer of defense. That yeah, was just a chunk. Yeah, well, I mean, but Remember, the further you move away, the more you have R square working against you, right? This is this is reflected energy. You got to send it down. It's got to bounce off. You've got to detect it. And so, I mean, even Leo has that problem. You're 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 scaling quite a bit. The huge advantage. You're in like the sweet spot almost with a a systems that, that that's at thirty to sixty thousand feet. You can see out at the the range that you need to. You can put enough energy against the target that you're trying to see and get it back that um you know is a lot harder from orbit not impossible but definitely i think it's got to be lower to orbit otherwise you're just too far out and just clarify it's being able to self-defend itself like dan said because it can get aircraft up there in front it can early warn to protect itself so it's not like a standing blunt that doesn't have an ability to self-defend itself in the practical terms that people can understand yeah, you there's no to... place for these in the first island chain. Uh, I, I don't, I don't see that. It'd be a, a lot harder to close that case, but, but definitely in the second island chain and homeland defense, this, it's a, it's almost a no-brainer. All right. Well, thank you. We're going to have uh, our board of advisors, Dave Shank, former 10th WMDC commander, open up uh, the questions day for, for the group. Okay. Hey, thanks, Ricky, and thanks for having me. Um, I think we've got time for uh, probably two questions and then uh, remaining five minutes for closing comments and then back to you, Ricky. Um, and really what I have is, uh, I wouldn't call them softballs, but uh, I'd like to lob them out there and, and maybe get some uh, feedback from each of you. Uh, I've got uh, two questions identified. Um, you know, we heard a number of terms uh, mentioned, layered, uh, networked. Uh, Corky mentioned commander's decision space. You know, Carbler mentioned uh, max attrition as far forward as possible. Uh, and I want to go back to the ring doorbell uh, analogy, if I may, General Carbler. Uh, and you talked about that that sensing uh, of this type of capability or detection. Uh, no matter how you look at the process, detect, track, ID, defeat, and then assess. Um, how, how do you how do you see uh, these uh, overhead persistent sensors? Uh, you talked a little bit about space, but how do you see them communicating? Uh, with space objects and each other, so tying it into a, an overarching uh, layered uh, and networked architecture. Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, uh, thanks, Dave. Um, so if you have the HBTSS, for example, as MDA goes to develop it, like I would uh, foresee that uh, tying into C2BMC. And right now, as we're developing uh, different service requirements, recognizing that C2BMC is really the backbone for our global missile defense architecture, we, we got to make sure that we tie into C2BMC. And, and from the Army side, uh, we, we recognize that requirement as, we, uh, as we're going forward on things like IBCS. Over. Dave, I'll piggyback on that as well. Just as we need layered sensors, we need layered comms. So I, I, I'm fairly certain the proliferated LEO constellation is going to have more than one path to get uh, data to the terrestrial and, and air systems, right? So we've got to have multiple paths to give us resiliency and redundancy. Dave, uh, the only thing I would add is, I mean, if you think through the architecture, you know, cognitively, maybe most of us, and I certainly was, uh, you know, well, we want to have these sensors, you know, in the vicinity of the defended area. Okay, so, you know, let's just use the second island chain as an example. But actually, if we position them even further forward, maybe even so far forward that they're, I mean, they're still outside any threat to the sensor itself on the platform. Okay, in this case, it needs to be an airship or a balloon. Um, but uh, the advantages of them being further forward, you may not be able to communicate the line of sight with the defended area, but then you would go through the space layer that you're talking about. So, you know, SDA tranche one or whatever, where, where you know, the, the, set, the platform with the sensor on it talks up, in the lower Earth orbit, it talks lateral, and then it comes down to the commanders and the effectors that are on, you know, a piece of terra firma somewhere on a ship. Uh, that could also be an important linkage in this, in, in how you lay out this architecture. Over. Okay, thanks, gentlemen. Um, and uh, not a question, but just a point I wanted to make and something to think about uh, uh, based on the, uh, the the history that General Carver laid out uh, about uh, the then 
Dugway, Aberdeen Proving Grounds versus the now and the, and the change of conditions uh, from the 90s to uh, the early 2000s to today. Um, just wanted to uh, lay that out. Second question, and, and I think probably the last question again, and I want to stay on the topic uh, of, of the uh, virtual here. Uh, can't see it, can't shoot it. And uh, somewhat rudimentary, uh, but uh, I even espouse that, uh, one, you got to see it, you got to talk about it, right? So meaning you got to share that information uh, with those who uh, either need to know or have a capability to do something about it. Uh, and then the third point is to do something about it. And so I say all that, uh, two of you, uh, maybe all three of you mentioned uh, uh, allies at some point in, in your comments. And uh, it's ch and you've all three served uh, 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 forward uh, and assigned responsibilities uh, at the theater level. Um, and so you recognize the challenges uh, with allies and, and partner nations, uh, but more specifically, policy and authorities. Um, just like to hear uh, a few comments uh, from each of you. Uh, based on, uh, you know, how, how do you get beyond that, that policy and authorities? And I'll use a quick example. Um, right now, counter UAS. Um, you know, if you have a, uh, a Ford uh, location, uh, which is U.S. soil in another country, once you leave that fence line, you're no longer uh, on U.S. soil. So uh, some challenges that exist there within that capacity of counter UAS. So uh, I'll open that up and uh, for each of you to uh, provide comment. Sure, sure, Dave. I'll, uh, I'll lead off. Uh, the MDR, Ricky talked about it, it recognizes the need uh, to share information with our allies, right? We can't, we're not going to do this fight by ourselves. You know, you've heard me say before that integrated air missile defense is a, it's a joint and uh, joint multinational team sport. And um, I would tell you that the data sharing authorities and the data sharing that's going on right now is significantly improved in the past three to four years. I'm not gonna get the operational details of it, but we've, we've leveraged what the MDR told us to do. We've leveraged uh, what policy has allowed us to do and, and we're moving out. And um, in some of that data sharing, you know, it might not be as technologically, uh, you know, it might not, you know, we, we might not be snap linking all the electrons together. Sometimes the data sharing is gonna be a little bit more swivel chair working out of the same op center together. But nonetheless, we're, we're data sharing and we are doing some of the technological data sharing. Um, and then the last piece I'll leave with is uh, with my GIFIC IND responsibility, we sponsor the Nimble Titan campaign where we have, you know, all countries that face a air missile defense threat. Not just, you know, we're not just talking NATO, we're not just talking the Middle East, we're not just talking, you know, PACOM, but everybody together participates in that Nimble Titan series. And when we get after TTXs, we get after uh developing ttps policy procedures etc again that's part of data and information sharing and that's been a that's um that's been a great effort and we continue to move out with uh with the nimble titan over Dave, i just want to comment on that dan if we had this in ukraine right now if we had this capability how, how significant would would have that been to reduce that the, the stuff coming in. I, I know they may have some, but I'm just saying this is unbelievable. On um, if you could have that asset and something like that, is that is that viable in terms of the effect of it? It would have had in this in this war. Yeah, Rick, I'm I'm not gonna. I, I can't really speak to the hypothetical there, not being on the ground there in Ukraine. But I would just go back to my earlier uh, comments that you know elevated sensors bring goodness to the battlefield gives commanders decision battle space, as Corky was talking about, it gives us extended range, it gives us uh, extended combat ID. Um, so, you know, an elevated sensor is gonna help uh, the commander's overall situational awareness and operations. I'll uh, I'll, back on I'll, I'll, go ahead, Todd. Okay, just, just real quick, Corky. I mean, the uh, Dave, on the answer to your question, I think first is, um, Many of these areas, we're going to have to be able to operate from the ally or partner's territory that we're defending. And so um, it's likely that they would be quite interested in sharing the data, and it should be a reasonable response back to us to be willing to share the data, considering that 
we're helping defend their sovereign territory. I, Australia, for example, um, in, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, second is that I think it's worth bearing in mind that this is a discussion about defense, not offense. Um, everybody is usually much more sensitive about information related to how we are able to target an opponent's capabilities and look deep and so on and so forth. This we are not talking about. Instead, we're talking about characterization of objects in the air domain such that a uh, defensive engagement could occur through you know, a variety of, of effectors, as well as just simply awareness and so that a uh, sovereign nation can understand what's going on in its, in its uh, sovereign airspace. So I think those factors make it a lot easier to share. And, and I agree with General Carver, we've made a lot of progress, particularly in the last five years, about sifting through the things that were impediments. We're not perfect by any means. But we're better than we were a while ago, and uh, and and I think we can continue that trend. Over, Corky. Yeah, I'll just piggyback on, on what you said there, Ty. We we share spaces with a lot of our partners. UC UAE is an example. We're all Doppler Air Brace. They have AF people. We have people. A year and a half, two years ago, a lot of things were flying at them from uh, from Yemen. And uh, what what did they ask us for? F 22s and AWACS. Uh, and I guarantee you, if we had some had equipped them with some sort of elevated sensor, uh, they would have happily shared information with us about what was flying uh, towards the country and towards that air base so that we could uh, jointly defend our people and their people that were on the ground there. So I think it's a bit of a no brainer uh, from a from a defensive perspective, like Ty is saying, and uh, and the and the actual threats throwing things at you uh, tend up tend to open up the policy options. Let's go around uh, for closing comments. It's been a great discussion. It's been awesome. So um, let, let's pass it around. And Dave, you can start if you'd like, and we'll just go go around. No, I, I'll defer to the uh, the three okay. panel members. But uh, what what a, what a great discussion you mentioned. Thanks, Ricky. Gordon, you want to go? Yeah, it, absolutely. Persistent, affordable, elevated, survivable sensors are an arrow we need not quit. We've got to have it. It's got to be part of our very approach. Preserve that commander's decision space, a trip as far forward as possible, as John Carlo was saying. Uh, we need to get after this yesterday yeah. as a yeah. mission. Thank you. Ty? Yeah. If you're out there listening and you agree with us, then probably the only question in your mind is, why aren't we doing this? And then <laughs> it gets to what's important. So let's get after it. I mean, if you're part of the policy community, let's start pushing on the policy side. If you're on the resourcing community, let's figure out how we're going to resource this thing. And if you're one of the services, let's not argue about who's going to do it. Let's just figure out how to do it. We can sort the rest of it out afterwards. This is an expeditionary capability that could apply to the homeland, but we've got to have it. So let's do this. Over. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Ricky. Uh, nothing I can really add to what Corky and uh, Ty uh, mentioned, but, uh, you know, again, since 1995, I've been involved in this from the inception of a requirement to testing it uh, to where we're at today. And uh, so the opportunity to discuss it is, uh, I really appreciate that. And I'll just close with uh, Go Pack Go, Ricky. Thanks. <laughs> you get your cheese back. <laughs> thanks, Dan. Hey, two things. The open architecture with our allies is huge. This could be the, the linker both in Europe, both both in the Pacific, being able to share some of that information we would get from an elevated sensor. It's a, it's a non-controversial one, not a shooter thing. This is doable across our whole domains with this type of information. We have to lead, and that's the key here. We have to lead, and there's no better platform. I think the American public, this is not an offensive system. This is a defensive system that protects their their nation. There's no way. I mean, the public is 100% behind this. This is it's ridiculous that we do not have this. We're spending six billion on Guam without this. We're we're open in our borders here. It's coming. It's got to come. We're going to keep pushing that to move forward. But what a great discussion! Thank you for your candor. Thank you for contributing. It's there. It's real. It's 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 been there as Dan says since '95. You guys have really helped, I think, educate our public on why this is a requirement and why this has to be done. So thank you very much. Go Niners! <laughs>